Thank you so much, Susan. And I appreciate people coming to meetings like this because behavior, well, it's the reason people have pets, isn't it? You know, we like a good looking pet. You know, we might prefer big dogs or little dogs or cats or something else, but it's their behavior, it's the interactions that make the difference. And um, not, to, not to diminish the importance of internal disorders, uh, surgical problems and the rest of it, but this is pretty important. And we look at how common is this problem separation anxiety? Well, most of us are aware that in general medicine, the most common thing we see is otitis. And if you look at this graph, you'll find that separation anxiety is actually a little bit more common. And the, the rhythm that we get into in general medicine is that the client comes in with a complaint. Pet has diarrhea or it's coughing or it's shaking its head. And we hone in right away on, on the problem. We want to take care of their complaint. And if they don't bring up the problem such as this dog is destructive, this dog is agitated, it barks continually, the neighbors are complaining, they might not even know that veterinarians are in any way knowledgeable in, in behavior. Well, we are, and we need to ask. And it can be a very simple question, like any problems when you're gone? I mean, something that simple. Now in the, in the space of a 20 minute exam time, you don't have a lot of time to get into behavior. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we can make that part of our practice and do the job right. But you know, I don't have to read this little graphic to you. You can see that these are largely undiagnosed and many of these pets are gonna end up uh, relinquished. And that's a heartbreaker for everybody. And it tends to worsen behaviors like separation anxiety behaviors. Well, you know, this slide, no lasting treatments. Actually there are, um, but we're gonna talk about those too. We have so many of these pets who, has, who have this problem. And so, you know, you can see that anxiety is very, very common. One in three pets that we see in the exam room has some kind of anxiety disorder. Um, and medications are used in about 10 or 20% of the separation anxiety cases. And unless they're very, very minor, they all need medications or a treatment like the common canine to change the neurochemistry in the brain because these are severe problems and these pets are miserable. And so, and they, and they never go away either. It isn't like if you give it enough time, they'll get better on their own. Typically because of the ramp ups in the neural circuitry of the brain, these circuits get stronger, measurably thicker on modern brain imaging methods like fMRIs and PET scans. Synapses get stronger. There's a greater number of excitatory and inhibitory neural inputs into each response. And practice makes perfect for a reason because with repetition, uh, these behaviors, if it's, a, if it's an athletic skill we're trying to get better at or a surgical skill that we're trying to improve, practice really helps us. And if it's a bad and unhealthy behavior, those things advance as well with repetition. So we need to get our arms around these things and early. We don't wanna wait until these pet parents come in and say, oh, I can't deal with this anymore. It's really advanced then. And like pretty much anything we treat in, in medicine, if we catch it early, we've got a much better shot. So I'm not gonna to have to read you the veterinarian's oath. We all have a pretty good idea, but it's important to remember that a priority on welfare, the animal welfare, and animal suffering. We think of suffering, you might think of pain from a fracture or from GI disease or skin disease. Well, those certainly qualify, but if any of us has any experience or knows anyone well who's had a severe mental illness or, or just some other challenge like anxiety and depression, these are very common problems in the human population and they are not fun. These dogs have a real miserable daily uh, challenge and we have an obligation. And this is just a video to show you that here's a dog who, if, if I had never asked these people to shoot this video, they wouldn't know. They knew that their, their neighbors were complaining, but this dog, uh, Mookie here, this guy, he never had any destructive behavior. He didn't house soil. Um, and they might not have known, but the neighbors were complaining. And the problem with many of these dogs is that there isn't much for the neighbors to complain about because how would anyone know, including the pet parent when they arrive home, that this kind of stuff is happening? 
Well, these are pretty serious signs because when a dog is home alone without its person, oh, it should enjoy playing with food dispensing toys and puzzles to extract its sustenance. Uh, many dogs just sleep. Um, they can be playing with the other pets. None of this behavior is normal. And so if people shoot video, and you're going to hear me say that a few times in the next hour, that's how we find out. Um, and it's actually quite easy to do, and I'll talk about that as well. And you see, some of these behaviors seem kind of contradictory with others. It isn't like there's one classical presentation for separation anxiety. A dog with this disorder can have any of these things going on or combinations of them. And I always encourage people to bring me a video and show it to me. Often they bring it on a, on a flash drive and I plug it into my laptop. House soiling, we'll talk about that because of course there can be other reasons for that. Um, but these are things that we need to find out. And you can ask people to just bring, a, bring in the video and drop it off at the desk and you can watch five minutes of video prior to your behavior consultation. Here's a dog from El Paso. And you notice you got this big fella here and this one here, you wouldn't even notice they're sleeping and resting. But then you got this little guy here, Volta, and you see those little bits of stuff around on the floor. Somebody's been kind of making a mess of things. And he goes over to the window and he's checking stuff out. Doesn't look agitated. And then uh, he might pace around a little bit more. Um, and then he's going to do something that was actually the reason that these people brought him in. They didn't bring him in because he was pacing around the house while they were gone. They brought him in because of this. And why is he marking? Well, you know, the first thing you can think of as well, he's got these other dogs. Is he competing with them? Well, it sure doesn't look like it, does it? I'll tell you why this little guy was doing this marking behavior and going over to the window. He certainly did have separation anxiety because we have a lot more video of him and he just hardly ever settles down. The poor guy is pacing and agitated, not highly agitated, but he's an unhappy guy. But he keeps going back to this window. And I have to admit, it was like three or four follow-ups into this case where I was getting a gradual handle on the on the behavior, the separation behaviors, and adjusting medications and teaching them behavior modifications until I finally said, you know, this little guy Volta, he keeps going to the window. Are there stray pets outside? Oh yeah, we feed a whole lot of stray neighborhood cats. <laughs> so, you know, he's... And you think, well, should that be a, a, a cause of distress for this little guy? It isn't distressing the other dogs. And the reason is that that little Bichon Frise, he's a guy who has an anxiety disorder. And that's why seeing them out there is the problem. They're not a problem for a normally behaved dog. There are two of them right there. But it's a problem for this guy. Well, there's a lot of things we had to do to change and improve this, this dog's life. And the owners, too, with all that urine. And one of them was that they had to stop feeding those neighborhood cats. They need to put out booby traps out in the yard. And some of them, they, they caught in little have a heart box traps and took them to uh, the Animal Humane Association to see if they could find them homes or get them back to their owners. But those, those stray creatures out in the yard, it can really be an important factor. So, you know, the brain, it's a very physical organ and it is considered the most complex in the body. <clears throat> and it's a very important part of of a behavior residency, it's much, we learn a lot more than just learning theory and psychopharmacology and interactions of disorders elsewhere in the body that, uh, that impact behavior. Uh, we learn a lot about neuroanatomy and neuropathology and neurophysiology. And <clears throat> the fear response is, is a pretty important thing. And, and you know, we all know that you know, there are pathways, there's the amygdala, uh, there are excitatory neurotransmitters like norepinephrine. Um, and, you know, we all have had that stab of fear or panic in our lives in some situations. The problem, though, occurs when it happens often, like every day. Now, needless to say, more people are working from home now, but most people have to go someplace some of the time, if in fact not 40 or 50 hours a week, like veterinarians, right, <laughs> or more. So what goes on when this happens on a, on a continuing basis? Well, that continual stress, chronic stress, that co that continual uh, uh, triggering of the hypothalamic pituitary axis and the cortisol release can have long-term uh, impacts on the body. And, uh, and 
not just to mention the brain itself. And so what we've got to do is realize that this is a lifelong problem because, and I've underlined a couple of things here, even after apparently successful long-term behavior modification, and that's an important part of what we do, well, let's not leave that out, um, but we can diminish these behaviors. We can desensitize to a lot of these things to the point where the client is saying, this dog is much better. We're monitoring videos and this dog is much more relaxed when we're, when we're at work and, and it's home by itself or with the other pets. And we're not seeing the urine soiling, for example, the neighbors aren't complaining about the vocalizations. We think we're much better. Well, let me explain something that I've learned from experience in behavior medicine. They don't teach you in your residency, but you know, people come in with symptoms and that's what concerns them. And then um, we make a big difference on some of these symptoms. Uh, we implement custom fitting and integrating multiple different modalities, and then they're much better. Well, in many cases, the symptoms occurred when the dog was pushed just over its threshold, just beyond its ability to manage. I'll give you a good example, and this will come up on another slide, is this COVID situation. Well, we haven't been down this path before. Well, people going to work 40, 50 hours a week, and these dogs are kind of maintaining. And the people didn't even know. They didn't know that their pets were agitated in their absence because there wasn't the house soiling or the, the destruction. And then they come home and boy, that dog thinks he's died and gone to heaven, right? Because this person is with him. And now those folks are going back to work. Well, now the dog destabilizes. He had or she had had some control over this emotional upheaval. And now it's lost control because the, the person is back away from home and back at work. Well, what we learn is that they can control a lot of this. And when they lose control, that's when the overt symptoms are very obvious to the owner. And then when we get our arms around a lot of this and we improve them, we may not have improved them as much as we think we may have toggled them only a little below their threshold. So the client is saying, oh, she's so much better now, but the real difference in the problem itself may be really not that much. And so some bump in the road comes along down the road. Sometimes, you know, a change in the household, uh, somebody moves out, somebody moves in, there's a divorce, there's a death, there's the death of another pet, a child is born. Sometimes these dogs destabilize and we don't know why. And so we have to make our client aware that yes, they can improve, but those long-term memory storages in the amygdala, in the, in the hypothalamus, uh, those go on, okay? Uh, in the hippocampus, pardon me. So here's Chloe. I think you know that this is Chloe. And these folks were creating their dog. We're gonna talk about why this is usually almost always a bad idea. Um, dogs are denning creatures, and but their natural innate behavior is to have the freedom and the choice to exit or enter their crate, their den, I should say, in the wild by their choice. So when we close the door on a dog crate, we've taken away that choice. And if we have an anxious dog who doesn't have the choice to get the heck out of there, doesn't have a dog door to leave the house and go outside and help itself feel better somehow, is trapped. And on top of that, we have a dog who, um, uh, it doesn't even feel like a den. Most crates that people use are wire crates like this. And if you cover it with a sheet, the top, all sides and the front down to maybe four or five inches from the, from the floor, the dog can see out, it feels a lot more like a den. But even still, we leave the, the crate door open. And people think, well, yeah, but the dog will destroy the place. Until we get these things improved, we send them to doggy daycare so they can play with other dogs and avoid this until medications, the calmer canine, our behavior modifications, all of these things start to make a difference. And then we can try again to have the dog at home with the crate open. Um, this is a formula for fractured incisors, uh, canine teeth, cut lips, uh, just misery, and we try to avoid that. And this right here, high anxiety, I did not make this name up. I found this on the internet, and that's what they call this thing that looks, well, you know, like solitary confinement prison cell. This is just not a good thing. The welfare of the creature is suffering horribly. Um, and 
there's, there's a way around this, believe me. And, and this is simply not the answer. So, you know, we go through a rule out list like anything else we do in veterinary medicine is we find, okay, what are the other possible uh, etiologies for these behaviors? Um, some of these problems are actually house training problems. Again, Volta, that little Bichon in the first video, these folks came in because they said, we've tried everything. I tried to get our arms around this dog's house soiling. We've hired trainers and read books and looked at YouTube videos. The dog still out soils. And of course, the first question is, does it ever happen when you're at home? Oh no, it only happens when we're gone. Well, there's a clue, right? Um, but we try not to assume anything. Does the dog have adequate access to get outside? I'm a big believer in, in dog doors, pet doors, whenever possible. Um, some of these dogs do it because they're marking um, and they can do that for stress related reasons. They can do that because there are other creatures outside as you've seen. Um, but just because a dog is house soiling doesn't mean that it has separation anxiety. And even if it just house soils when, it, when the people are gone, doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, got separation anxiety because those stressors outside, like those stray cats in, in the first video, this little guy might have been paying very little or no attention to those creatures when it was interacting with its people. They show me videos of, the, of that little dog interacting with them and he's this cute little guy who's in their lap, totally bonded, snuggling all the time. He's not even thinking about those stray cats outside until they're gone, until the people are gone. So we've got to figure out these, you know, pick the little parts in, into little pieces. Uh, destructive behavior can also occur when you've got a dog who just doesn't have enough canine specific and ideally be behavioral opportunities that are particular to the individual or the individual's breed. You know, you can, I got one of these uh, little ball, uh, shooting devices for my yard and my my border colleague was supposed to go out and pick up the tennis balls and put them back in and shoot them back out he never caught on because he's not a retriever he's a herding dog so we have balls out there for him to herd which of course he does when i go out and kick the ball <laughs> but he wants to herd things not retrieve things you want to give your dog opportunities to do stuff that that dog needs to do and people need to find your individual dogs um, find its passion, right? And I'm going to talk about a little bit of other things that apply to pretty much all dogs, but they need to stay occupied doing something canine specific, okay? Running on a treadmill doesn't quite get it. Um, but, you know, some of these are territorial behaviors that, you know, the delivery people come to the door uh, more all the time now because a lot more people order things online and the dog's digging up the carpet at the base of the exit door. That could be separation anxiety. Dogs do that but it also could be uh, territorial behaviors. And we're gonna treat those differently. People live near an airport, noise phobia problems. Um, and of course, vocalizations have other possible uh, underlying causes as well. So we, we don't assume, we do our best to understand, well, what, what are the underlying causes and what aren't they? Um, and don't forget, you know, internal medicine issues. And this is by no means a complete list. But you know, dogs who are PUPD because they're Cushingoid or maybe diabetes, I should add that in. Cognitive dysfunction syndrome, and I've got a brief video on that. I wanna talk about that briefly because when you have a dog whose behavior changes when it's eight to 12 years old and the dog used to do just fine and now it's not, uh, you have to say, okay, why has this changed? Oh, well, there've been environmental changes. Uh, maybe, is this dog physically ill internally? Maybe, is this dog got dementia because of cognitive dysfunction? Yeah, um, dogs 10 to 12 years old, there's a 28% likelihood of cognitive dysfunction. Dogs 14 to 16 age, 68% of them have cognitive decline. Um, and these things can cause them not just to house soil and forget their house training skills, but become anxious and destructive and do things they never did before. Um, and of course, there are medications that can be responsible for this stuff. And it isn't that surveillance video at home and the client's absence is the only way to gather information. But, you know, back in the day, we didn't have these. Pretty much now, everybody has a video camera in their pocket, um, or they might have a surveillance system at home. We'll talk a little bit more about getting videos, but it's, it's doable and it's essential to know what the heck's going on. So this old timer here, um, 
these folks uh, didn't quite know they had a problem. And I said, well, just shoot some video of this little corgi. And you can see he's sniffing and poking around, but at nothing in particular. And then he just stops and he looks around back and forth and he doesn't know what he should be doing. Where is he going? I mean, he doesn't really have a purpose in anything that he's doing. He's just confused. This dog has cognitive dysfunction syndrome. And of course, there are questionnaires that we that we distribute and have people complete. That's a whole subject unto itself. I, I've got an affinity for this disorder. It was the subject of my uh, research uh, that, uh, that I did in my, uh, during my residency. So anyway, these are things that we, we tend to forget to ask about because that's not the reason that people come in. And cognitive dysfunction, especially in the early stages, many people um, say, well, it's an older dog. Well, there are aging brain changes that are normal and there are those that aren't. And so a, a one-page um, simple behavior questionnaire for senior dogs and cats, because cats get it too, um, and their symptoms are somewhat different usually. And by the way, if you would like me to send you that one-page real simple questionnaire, you can email me. And if you want to write down my email address, and I can give it to you again later, it is J, like Jeff, J Nickel, N-I-C-H-O-L, D-V-M, at AOL.com. And that stands for aoldguy.com. And if you say, hey, send me that senior pet questionnaire, I'd be happy to email it to you. Um, so management changes. These are things that people have to do for the rest of this dog's life. They don't get a choice. They have to do this stuff. Ignore when preparing to leave, during departures and when returning. You can explain that if they were living in a free living social group, the leader of the group, like every dog in the group, has a real essential social behavioral need to get off the territory, that is out of the territory, at least a time or two a day to sniff and investigate and read the bulletin boards. They have to do that stuff. And the leader does too. And unlike our human families, what the leader does not do in the free living canine group is it doesn't go to everybody in the group and say, how about a hug and drive safely and all that. When the leader leaves, they just leave. And when the pet parent anthropomorphizes, which I think we all do to some extent, and they know the dog is a nervous wreck and might even be destructive in their absence, they make a big fuss when they leave and they return. And that just jacks up the anxiety another level because the dog says, what's wrong with this picture? They need to treat their dog like a dog at those times and have all the interaction and love and affection at any other time, but never associated with leaving and returning. Exercise makes a big difference, you know, the endorphins, but also we know that serotonin, the primary drug that we, well, we don't use serotonin, but the primary neurotransmitter that we try to potentiate with medications um, and the calmer canine does many other things in addition to that. We know that that serotonin is produced in the brain, but it's also produced and released in skeletal muscles. And so if you have one of these dogs that people can run it really hard and heavy, and play with real exertion prior to go, leaving home, then those dogs are going to be calmer because they have more serotonin and they have the endorphin release. It's not the end all and be all, but it can certainly be helpful, okay? Um, and if you don't feed them in the morning, then what you can do is you can um, give them a food dispensing toy. This is just one of many, this is called a twist and treat. Um, the best food toys for any particular pet are the ones that that pet uses, but if the pet is food motivated and it has to extract its food from some relatively challenging food dispensing toy or puzzle, the dog not only stays occupied instead of you know twisting its little paws about how nervous and anxious it is, but it's focusing on a canine natural survival behavior. You know, dogs are predators, they eat what they kill, but most of the time in the wild, they subsist on carrion, they find dead stuff and they have to extract little bits of food from some rotting carcass. Well, give them a food toy uh, and rotate them, have plenty of them. And they have, to, uh, they have to work at this stuff and sort of be a dog, even though its person isn't there. Um, and then, you know, the other things that you can do with this kind of thing is, is play music that is intended for dogs called Throw Your Dog's Ear. People can download it onto their computer or, or these folks will mail a CD and they can play it on their CD player. Um, again, none of this stuff is the only answer. We have to integrate 
a whole bunch of stuff. And with some trial and error, uh, with follow-up consultations, you fine tune what's going to work the best. Um, pick these food toys up when you get home and the, and the owner drops them on the floor as they leave. And what we want the dog to learn over time is that, oh, I see my person getting ready to go. I think that means I'll get an opportunity to survive another day and work on a food toy. And that's what they're supposed to spend a significant amount of their time doing is surviving. That is their innate genetically programmed behavior. And we tend to forget about that. We feed dogs from bowls, but in, they, they didn't survive in the wild and evolve to this point by eating out of a bowl in the wilderness. They had to find their food. So treat them like a dog. So video monitoring, it's really essential to this. There's things called like a nest cam. You can get a couple of nest cams for 99 bucks on the internet and um, with a, you know an app for the smartphone. People can see what the dog's doing in their absence. This other gizmo called the, called the Furbo is a wonderful tool because you know people, if they've got a desk job, they can have their laptop or their smartphone open on their desk. And when the dog starts to get wiggy, they can talk to the dog and give it a command and, and release a treat as a reinforcer. That's pretty powerful. But the point I made in the middle is that people say, I don't want to spend any money. Say, so go to the internet and get a tabletop tripod for seven to 10 bucks. Put your smartphone on it and leave and come back in 20 or 30 minutes. And we'll see what the heck your dog is doing. Um, it's just essential. So behavior modification. Um, we got to do this stuff. Um, and there are some dog trainers who are pretty good at this stuff. There are even courses that they can take uh, to become knowledgeable. Of course, they cannot do a physical exam and, and evaluate lab work to try to um, uh, you know, rule out the, the other comorbidities. Uh, that's our job. And the, the diagnostic process, the diagnostic concept, we learn that in veterinary school and we practice that in our day-to-day -day work um, and finding all those other issues that are going on. And, I don't think people other than a doctor, a real DVM or a VMD could, could really do that as well. Nonetheless, what I do sometimes is I have a, a pretty darn effective, very knowledgeable and qualified dog trainer, and I will dispatch him to people's homes to help him custom fit these behavior modification methods in people's homes. And that's a really helpful additional service that I can provide people. He's not my employee. He doesn't work for me. I've had other trainers. Um, he just, he's independent and he goes there and they pay him directly. Um, but we communicate. This is what I think we need on this case. Report, let me know how you're doing. Run into challenges, let me know. We'll adjust what we're doing. But this kind of stuff is very time consuming. Um, and there are people who believe this is the only path. It is not. Even people who do this really, really well are gonna have substandard results unless they add in medications and or the calmer canine. And I go with and actually, because I want results, okay? So, um, you know, again, there are many doctors, veterinarians who prescribe and say, okay, see how it goes. Well, if you just see how it goes, some of these pets are gonna get worse because the dog has replayed these ramp ups in the, in the neural circuits in the brain and those circuits get stronger. So please don't fiddle around, um, get started right away. Um, now, one thing about the Comra canine, we'll talk more about that in a minute, is that that is marketed for as the non-drug solution for separation anxiety. And yes, we all know there are people out there who say no drugs. Um, okay, you know, <laughs> you can't convince them how safe these things are, but um, they're pretty essential if you're really going to do your very best. Reconcile is the, is the uh, uh, veterinary approved, canine approved. It's chewable, it's safe. Um, and frankly, it is better in many cases than the generic because the generic is formulated for intestinal absorption into the human. Uh, many dogs absorb fluoxetine generic fine, and some don't. If you use the veterinary brand, uh, it's a known quantity. And the same if you go with clomipramine. And which is better? Yeah, you know, it's whichever you like better, you can start with. And if one doesn't work as well, then try the other. Um, there are a couple of chewable brands. Canaquel is a new one on the scene. Um, it is cheaper than Clomacom. And I have found it to be every bit as good um, and every bit as palatable. 
Um, but we tend to use higher doses than what's in the label on clomipramine. It is, uh, it's the research that was done for FDA approval was done on just once daily administration. We pretty much always go twice a day and we'll go as high as four and a half mg per kg, which can make it kind of expensive, which you know puts you back in the fluoxetine camp. Um, trazodone is not a effective sole or primary anxiolytic. And many doctors like it because you don't have to wait three or four weeks like you do with a SSRI like fluoxetine or a tricyclic like clomipramine, um, but it is much more effective as an adjunct. Um, and we do it uh, with an SNRI, which sometimes we'll use those drugs like um, venlafaxine, for example, on some dogs who are refractory to an SSRI or a tricyclic, that can be helpful. I mean, we make adjustments until we get the drugs as good as we can. But adding on trazodone, you can do it an hour or two prior to the client's departure. And in some cases, depending on whether you've got a generalized anxiety, uh, you may want to use it just BID every day. Uh, benzodiazepines, uh, you know, whether you like lorazepam, diazepam, alprazolam, you know, the list goes on. Clonazepam is an, is an economical one that's much longer in duration than the others. Most are only good for a few hours. But you can safely add those on to most of these, although we don't typically add them with propranolol because these dogs tend to like pass out. So we don't want that. But you can use propranolol with these others and that can be helpful. Lately, most of us in, in the behavior community have been adding in clonidine. Um, and I found that that's a very good add-on. We typically don't use that with propranolol. Um, but it can be pretty good with some of these aggression cases for some somewhat different reasons. Um, but these dogs, um, uh, they are less anxious and less tend to panic because we've limited the norepinephrine release. And again, venlafaxine, if, if you have to start getting a little bit exotic because the, the basics haven't panned out, um, we do what it takes. And of course there are non-pharmaceuticals. And again, there are people who say, I don't want, I don't want drugs, I want something natural. Well, that's, that's okay. And in fact, these, all of these things on this slide can be very safely added um, to, the, to the pharmaceuticals we just discussed. But when you wanna use zilkine, which is alpha-cazazepine or anxetine, which is L-theanine, soliquin actually has a few different flower essences like magnolia and a couple of things. I think it has L-theanine as well. Um, these things all have pretty good research to support them. But if that's the only thing you can talk your client into using um, and they have a very minor separation uh, behavior, they might be okay along with behavior modification and, and adaptal, which is a pheromone. This is the diffuser, which um, I think those are helpful. They're, you know, you'll have people say, well, I tried that, didn't do anything. Well, yeah, they had a really severe case and by itself, it's not going to put much of a dent in it but it can be helpful to add on. And by the way, any of these things can be added safely to the drugs that we're using and can help make a difference. So I'm not saying they're fluff, they are not. They can be very useful. The people have to understand what they don't do. And, and back to Adaptal for just a minute, these um, diffusers can be pretty darn helpful in relatively small rooms because they diffuse into the air in the room. But you know, most modern homes have these open floor plans and you know, high ceilings. And the stuff just never develops an adequate concentration in the air for the glomeral nasal gland at the back of the turbinates to really pick it up. Um, and for those dogs, an adaptal collar can be pretty handy. These are good for about a month. People can get them online, of course, but adaptal collars can be pretty, pretty helpful. Um, but this is really the star of the show. And I like this a great deal because I've, I've seen really good results with it. But like, I mean, nothing works in every case. Um, and I don't wait until, gee, the drugs haven't done the job the way I'd like. I add this in early every chance I can. But this is something that um, uh, people put this on at home. And you can see this dog sitting here wearing it. Most of them tolerate it just fine. If you look, he's wearing this little this thing we call a vest. It's a two-part thing that wraps around the dog's chest and around its neck. And it has this thing you can see going between the dog's front legs that attaches by Velcro. Um, and the, the value of this vest is that what you don't see is behind this dog's neck is a Velcro patch. 
And this lightweight halo shaped thing is what has the pulse electromagnetic field device that targets the amygdala sitting right back there. And it's got a little button you push and it runs for 15 uh, minutes, pardon me, turns itself off. There is no sensation. Um, the dog doesn't even notice it. And the dog can walk around and be active. If they start playing hard, it falls off. You can stick it back on. It doesn't get damaged easily. It's a twice daily thing. It's a little bit of a pain in the neck for some people. Um, and uh, But people get used to it. You know, they're having breakfast in the morning. In the evening, they're watching TV or something. Um, they can hold the thing on the dog. I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes. Um, but these things are, are pretty darn helpful. And we've seen some very good results. Um, but you can see from this slide that these are electromagnetic signals. And we are promoting or potentiating the production of nitric oxide. And this actually reduces inflammation in the brain. Um, and it promotes more uh, of the neurotransmitters we want, not just the anxiolytic serotonin, but the dopamine. Um, and that really helps with anxiety because everybody feels better, the endorphins. Um, and you get a dog who is a calmer dog. It takes four to six weeks for these things to start making a difference. Um, and then after a four to six week course, and people say, gee, this pet's better. Well, you don't have to continue using it. But in many cases, in my experience, after several months, um, they say, oh, this, we're starting to have a problem again. And they need to be monitoring with video. Even if things are going very nicely, they need to be checking a video at least once a week when they're away from home. And they see the dog start to pace and look agitated and scanning, looking back and forth, getting hypervigilant or other worse symptoms. Um, they can start another treatment course in usually just a couple of weeks of twice daily 15 minute uh, treatments and they're better again. And most of these dogs every few months, sometimes every six months, you have to do it again. And so you can see on the bottom of this iris setter how they're putting on this little vest and then sticking the, the halo shaped device on behind the dog's head. And then the person on the, on the left hand side with that little Lhasa Apso is holding it. You can do that if People don't want to invest in the vest, which, you know, these things are 25 or 30 bucks. It's not an enormous sum for the vest, but you don't have to have it. They can just hold the thing. But I really lean on people to, to do it that way because, you know, if you make it easy for them, they're likely to do it, right? So here's a story of this little dog named Kita who accepted this very well. And admittedly, there are a few dogs who don't want to wear the vest, but almost all of them will. Um, and they found that she was pacing. And of course, they tried confining her to a wire crate. They used zip ties. I, somehow it makes sense to people to, you know, make these things like a fortress that the dog cannot escape. And gosh, that's, frankly, it's the last thing you want to do. And you have to tell people, we're not going to do that anymore. They get more frantic and they associate an even greater sense of panic. Um, and so their, their general practice veterinarian had prescribed fluoxetine and they said it helped. But then they said, oh, we worried. Why do people do that? I don't know, but they do that and they'll stop using a medication without telling us. And so we have to be in touch and we have to explain to them, no, these things are safe and they don't, you know, destroy internal organs. And we're going to, if we're going to use these medications long-term, we're going to do an annual exam and we're going to submit annual lab profiles and make sure that, no, they're not going to damage internal organs, but that we're not developing a hepatopathy or a nephropathy or some other internal problem that would maybe reduce the safety of these. So we need to do this and, and they'll do it. I don't have any problem with this. So they find that, you know, this dog improved. Uh, within, they said a couple of weeks and we do see improvements that quickly sometimes. Um, and we'll often find that other anxiety related behaviors improve as well. This is only approved for separation anxiety, but you know, we veterinarians are, you know, we're cowboys every day of the week and we're off label and you try to remember to, explain to people, oh, this drug is not approved for dogs or for this indication, or, you know, the Comer canine is not approved in puppies under, under a year. Well, it's been used in dogs under a year. Nobody's had a problem. Well, you know, it's not approved. So you have to tell them that kind of stuff um, and explain that it's probably going to be three to four weeks, but then some of them respond much more quickly like this dog Kita has done. Um, and now she's a uh, She's not over bonded the way she once was. And this following behavior, by the way, uh, had long been considered to be part and parcel of 
separation anxiety. Turns out it's it's a different problem over attachment or over bonding. Although uh, a great number of dogs with separation anxiety are also over bonded. And so as much as that's not a symptom that really causes people and their dogs a lot of distress, when the person isn't there, how the heck can the dog follow them and they can start to freak out? So when the dog's anxiety is significantly less, we often find that, um, wow, they're not following the owner. They're not pestering. They're not nudging their arm and pawing at them for attention. And that's a more peaceful dog who's enjoying a healthier life. And um, we want that. And and I explain to people, look, we, we want this dog to enjoy life. It's much more than about the damage or the soiling or or even all that pacing. We just want this dog to be happy and content. And people nod their head and go, yeah, we do. And so, yeah, the calmer canine can certainly help with that. So, um, you know, I mentioned this earlier. I call this the sleeping giant. Um, you know, dogs, by their nature, whether they're behaviorally healthy or they've got an anxiety disorder, they really like predictability. You know, one event predicts the next and the next. And so most dogs are going to do better regardless of what's going on in their brains, if they have a, a daily routine, which most events are pretty predictable, you know, they get up, they go outside, they come back in, they get fed, they go for a walk, you know, they have a routine and that matters. Um, but anxiety is sort of the opposite of that. And this is just a basic definition of anxiety, the worry, nervousness uh, in an imminent event, something with an uncertain outcome. And they've determined in people 95% of the things that people have anxiety about would never happen. Well, we can't ask dogs and cats about that, but from my observation, it's about the same. On the other hand, if a dog who has a separation anxiety problem has a routine, a structure that's predictable, if the dog knows what's going to happen next, then they are much less prone to, you know, wig out about what might happen next because they know. So, for example, if the owner, ideally, rather than allow the dog to start ramping up its anxiety as it sees its person getting ready for work, put the dog elsewhere with a food dispensing toy while the person prepares to go to work. And if they can leave through another door so the dog doesn't even see them and they come home and ignore until the dog is relaxed. And as they leave, a really predictable event is this hungry dog gets access to food dispensing toys and puzzles, and it survives while the people are gone. That's what it's supposed to be doing with its time. Um, and they can play with these food dispensing toys. I mean, they are toys. Um, but, you know, you have to explain to people, well, why does this happen? People tend to blame themselves. It's my fault. Well, we have real strong uh, genomic evidence about the genetic predisposition some of these dogs have, but environmental uh, influences like a stay at the shelter. Those dogs have a significantly higher incidence. Dogs have been rehomed multiple times. Um, just, you know, they get a dog like that and say, look, this isn't your fault. These things happen. But in most cases, we can make a significant difference. Of course, we don't use the G word. We don't guarantee, right? But we, but we can make a difference. Um, so, you know, being proactive and explaining that to the clients. We're going to shoot video and we're always going to video monitor um, and start the Comer K9 ASAP, just like the medications, because it does take a few weeks for them to start becoming effective. And this is just some basic information on some research that was done recently by one of my colleagues, Dr. Margaret Gruen. Uh, Margaret's at North Carolina State. She is primarily a researcher and a teacher. Um, she did her residency along with me, and um, I have tremendous faith, and you'll see that Margaret Gruen publishes a lot. <laughs> this is a relatively small group study. There'll be others. Um, and of course, you know, you cannot do a double blind study when you're putting this stuff on the dog every day. Um, and so, yeah, there could have been some caregiver placebo effect, um, but there's no doubt that most of these dogs improve pretty darn impressively. And so, you know, I like to show pictures like this to clients because here's this dog relaxing, just sitting in his person's lap um, and getting its treatment, which, you know, becomes such a routine that nobody even pays attention. You know, it's just what we do twice a day, four to six weeks, and then every few months we do another couple of weeks.